over the last two months, God has helped them to put down the cigarettes and not pick up a single cigarette in over two months. Now it took a little bit of effort. It took a little bit of self-sacrifice. In fact, that was preceded by a seven-day fast. You can push a plate away for seven days. You can push cigarettes away for life. Which leaves us with the uncomfortable reality. Sometimes the only reason we're still bound by something is because there's an element of us that still wants it. Ha. But if you'll yield to him today, and you'll say, God, I want it out of me. I want it gone. I, I want every suicidal thought to be gone gone. I, I want every anxious thought and mindset to flee. God, I yield my will totally and completely to yours. Then the God that changes everything is in this place today, today, today to set you free. Amen. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Ha. Ha. My mind's all over the place. I, I know ultimately where we are supposed to go. I'm going to need you to stick with me and we're going to get there. Can we do that together? Is there anybody that's going to stick with me here for the next 20, 30 minutes, 40, 50 minutes, 20 minutes? That's our goal. Amen. Thank you so much to all of our guests that are in the house today. I want you to know that we truly value you. We are so thankful that you took time out of your busy Sunday to come and to spend it with us and to worship Jesus with us. I want you to feel at home. If you have any questions, any questions at all, after this service is over, I would love to connect with you. I'd love to talk with you. I'd love to answer any question that you may have to the best of my ability. Amen. Let's go to Philippians chapter 3 and verse 1. That's so nice. You just keep it up for a little bit longer. That was, that, was, that was just beautiful. Unless you already took your ears out, then you could be done. Philippians 3 and 1. <clears throat> Finally, my brethren, sisters, you're not excused today. That means all of us. Finally means this is the last thing. Curiously, Paul writes this in Philippians chapter 3 when Philippians chapter 4 exists. But he says, finally, my brother. So if you ever get frustrated at the preacher saying just a few more minutes, remember that Paul was writing. He said, look, this is the last thing. And then he wrote a whole other chapter, okay? Finally, my brethren and sistren. Go ahead and poke your neighbor and tell him that's you. Rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, it ain't bothering me, he said, but for you it is safe. Just fair warning, you've heard much of what I'm about to preach before, but like Paul, it's not grievous to me. I'll preach it again. And for you, it's safety. Because if, if God keeps bringing a specific topic up over and over and over, it means that it hasn't been completely solidified into the foundation of our hearts. Philippians chapter 4. This is Philippians' bonus chapter. And verse 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Whew. It's almost as if Paul was trying to drive a point home. He said, look, it's not grievous to me to bring it up, and so I'll do it again in chapter 4. 
Rejoice in the Lord always. Now that Greek word always, it doesn't really matter what Greek word it comes from, but it literally means exactly what it means in common English today. At all times, all moments, all seasons, all hours, all days, all months, all heartaches, all trials, all tribulations, uh, all temptations, all struggles, uh, all sicknesses, everything you find yourself in, rejoice. And again I say, rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing. Another translation will render it this way. Don't be anxious or worried about anything. We heard a word this morning in the 10 a.m. session. We do not have to be anxious when we have a God that freely gives us good gifts and owns the cattle on 10,000 hills. But he said, in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And if you'll do that, the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Mm. I feel the peace of God wanting to unlock this place today. Wanting to flow through this house. Ha, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We're going to pray. We're going to dive into the word. And when, when God's ready to move, we're just going to let him move. Amen. With your attention for the next few moments, I simply want to preach, dig. Would you poke your neighbor in the ribs one more time and tell him, dig. Now let's set our Bibles to the side. Let's lift our hands into the air. Let's lift our voices together and ask God to have his way in this house. Lord, I thank you for your goodness. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your grace and your kindness, your love. There's none before you. There's none, God, that compares. Uh, You are God. You are God alone. Uh, There's only one God, and his name is Jesus. Uh, Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Uh, At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow uh, of things in heaven uh, and of things on the earth and of things under the earth, uh, and every tongue will confess uh, that Jesus Christ is Lord uh, to the glory of God. Uh, Come on, would somebody uh, begin to confess? That's that name of Jesus in this house today. (laughs) Amen. You may be seated. I will confess to you today, uh, part of my reason to be brief or try to be brief is that I feel like my head's about to explode. So, amen. I might need need a pinch runner today or a pinch dancer. Like a, like a baseball player, all right? You guys know what a pinch hitter is? None of, none of you? Well, that's fantastic, but you could all quote Deuteronomy 6 and 4 for me, so I'm happy about that. I'd rather you could do that than know anything about baseball. Okay, let me explain it for you. A pinch runner is you literally have somebody stand in for you and run in your place. Maybe they're faster, they're better at stealing the bases, or their head doesn't feel like it's about to explode, okay? So you five on the front row, is anybody willing to help me? All right, all right, I got, I got Brother Flores willing to help me. All right, he's going to be my pinch runner. When I point to you, that means I need a pinch runner, and uh, I just need you to take a lap. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> Paul was writing... Philippians, from a Roman prison. Is that not curious to you? Here he is, great apostle of the Lord, writing to a church and commanding them to rejoice. 
writing to them and commanding them, look, uh, be of good cheer. If you'll read the book, you'll find out the apostle spends almost the entire book encouraging them to be cheerful out of the abundance of his cheer, though he's the one sitting in prison. It's curious to me. He spends multiple verses, effort, and pages telling the Philippians, look, be of good cheer. Rejoice. Jesus is king. He's on the throne. Every knee's going to bow to him. It's all going to be okay. And I've simply come to encourage a church today. It does not matter what the circumstance or the situation. We've got a commandment from our God to rejoice in him always. That means all the time. That means every Sunday. That means every Wednesday. Day. That means every moment of every day, uh, there's no circumstance or situation uh, that is greater than my God. Uh, he's always worthy of praise. Uh, he's always worthy of rejoicing. Uh, he's always worthy uh, of everything that I have uh, to give him. He is always worthy. And so Paul commands us, rejoice in the Lord always. Don't rejoice in your own strength. Don't rejoice in the worship team. Don't rejoice in the size of the church. Don't rejoice in the size of your bank account. Don't rejoice that your football team won or your political candidate won. But even if they lose and your bank account's empty and your health is shot, you can still rejoice in the Lord at all times. And again, I say, rejoice. In Isaiah chapter 12, the prophet is writing to the children of Judah. And they're facing, if they will not repent, if they will not turn, they're facing banishment from their promised country. And even though God is angry with them, chapter 11, God begins to lay out he begins to share some of the things that are going to happen to them in the absence of repentance. Then he turns the page to chapter 12. And no longer is it the voice of God speaking to his people and pleading with them to turn from wickedness and warning them of what would come. Isaiah steps into a new realm and begins to prophesy of a day when the people of God would be collected back together and he writes in Isaiah 12 and 1 in that day the day where God begins to gather them together from the winds where God begins to call out a people from among every people you see this was not just written to the children of Israel thousands of years ago but it was written looking ahead also to the church age it was written looking ahead to the day when he would look into the city of Watertown South Dakota he would look into this region and he would know that there are 22,655 people in this town and many of them have never heard about baptism in Jesus' name or the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. And so the prophet begins to say, in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee. Though you were angry with me, your anger, it is turned away and you comforted me. Behold! God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. I, the Lord Jehovah, is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. Let's just look right into the Hebrew right there. The last three words are the name Yeshua. Jehovah became salvation. That is the name of Jesus Christ. The prophet's looking ahead to a day, to a moment, uh, where these people, though God was angry with them, how many of you know that God has a right to be angry with you? Well, that went over like bacon at a bar mitzvah. I've done some pretty stupid things. I've made some pretty serious mistakes. And God dealt with me with some anger involved. 
But his anger doesn't tarry forever because the Bible says that he is slow to anger. He's long-suffering, and he's plenteous in mercy. And so now the people are saying, look, you were right to be angry with me, but you're not still angry with me. And so, God, you're my salvation, and I trust in you. And look at verse 3. It says, therefore with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. And in that day ye shall pray or say, praise the Lord. Call upon his name. Declare his doings among the people. Make mention that his name is exalted. Sing unto the Lord for he hath done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, thou inhabitant in Zion. For great is the Holy One in the midst of thee. Uh, I've just come to remind a church, uh, God was angry at me in my sin, uh, but he came uh, and became salvation. uh, And so now uh, I can draw with joy uh, water from the wells of salvation. Just a sidebar. In six verses of Scripture... It gives us seven ways to use our voice. Say, call upon, declare, make mention, sing, cry out, and shout. He makes absolutely zero mention of born-again children of God sitting in silence with their lips sealed. Because the expectation and the mindset of God is, uh, I've poured out my salvation to them. Uh, They will praise me. I think it would be fitting right now if we would take a moment and one of those seven things, I want you to do it. Uh, Whether it is going to be saying it, calling upon it, declaring it, making mention of it, singing it, crying it, uh, or shouting it aloud. Uh, Let every voice do something. Uh, Everyone that's thankful for a God of salvation. Come on, draw with joy, draw with joy, draw with joy, water from the wells of salvation right now. That's all right, that's all right, that's all right. Somebody draw with joy right now. Somebody draw with joy right now. Somebody pull. There is a bottomless well of salvation. There is a bottomless well of salvation. And you want to pull, pull. We can look into the New Testament in John chapter 7 and verse 37. When Jesus stands up at the feast and he cries, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me as the scripture hath said, out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the spirit which they that believed on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given. Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus was looking ahead to a day of Pentecost where the spirit would be poured out. And the Holy Ghost would be made available to you and I. And in that day, that well of salvation that Isaiah had mentioned was now not just going to be an external well. It was going to be something down on the inside of you. And the Bible lets us know that with joy, we can draw water out of the wells of salvation. With joy, I can begin to pull up. With joy, no matter what's going on on the outside, I've got a well on the inside of the Spirit of God springing up in my life. Rejoice. In the Lord, always. And again, I say, 
Rejoice. Come on, somebody. Uh, rejoice in the Lord always. Uh, and again, I say rejoice. Uh, go ahead and tap down into a well of salvation. Uh, go ahead and tap down into a well uh, of the Spirit and let it bubble and flow out of your life. Now, why would Paul take the time to write it three times? And why, why would God take the time to inspire this church to hear about it 96 times? Because evidently, the experience of the Philippians was not one of constant rejoicing. And the experience of Jesus' church, or many in Jesus' church, has not been one of a constant rejoicing. There's a problem when the promises of Scripture don't align with the actuality of our life. And the enemy of your soul can begin to convince you that it does not apply to you. He was writing to these super spiritual people, but you're, you're not one of them. You're, you're, you're not one of, of those ones that he was writing. He was writing to the Philippians. They, they, they face different things than we face today. The church in Philippi faced incredible hardship but needed to be reminded to rejoice. They needed to be reminded to encourage themselves in the Lord. Uh, they needed to be reminded every so often uh, that God is God uh, and he's on the throne uh, and there's nothing and no one that can come against his power. Uh, as we heard this morning, uh, he thinks good thoughts towards us. Uh, he's a God that's going to bless us. Uh, he's a God that will prosper us. Uh, he's a God that has our best interest in mind. And so there are things in our lives that can begin, that can begin to squelch that rejoicing. We can read about some of these in Genesis chapter 26 in the story of Isaac. And I, I'm going to hurry through this. If you want some great reading, go read it on your, on your free time, your spare time. But Isaac, Isaac is the heir of everything that Abraham has owned. He is the one that, that Abram has blessed. He's given him everything. He sent Ishmael away. He sent all of his other sons away. But everything that he owns and the promise of God's promised son comes through Isaac. This is the one. And the Bible records a, a series of events in the life of Isaac in Genesis chapter 26. Isaac is widely known as a well digger because it is the most written about portion of his life. It is digging wells and getting deceived by his son Jacob. He was really good at deceiving everybody. He just deceived like all kinds of people. But there's something important about the life of Isaac. The Bible says that in Genesis chapter 26, or yeah, Genesis chapter 26 and verse 18, Isaac digged again the wells of water which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father because the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. Earlier in the chapter it says they stopped them with earth. Sometimes the reason that your experience doesn't match with the word of God is because the enemy has been allowed to come in and to fill up a well, to fill up a springing fountain with earth, with the world itself, with dirt. I've come today simply to tell somebody uh, it's time 
to dig. Uh, it's time to get into that well. Uh, if there's any carnality, get it out. Uh, if there's any worldliness, get it out. Uh, I'll, I'll go one step further. If there's anything at all, uh, whether sinful or not, uh, that puts a wall or a barrier between you and a flowing spirit uh, of salvation inside of you, uh, remove it. Dig it out. And begin to pray the same prayer that the Israelites prayed in Numbers chapter 21. Spring up, oh well. Spring up, oh well. Oh, I don't believe Jesus was joking for a second when he said, rivers of living water will flow out of your belly. And yet so often we come to the house of God. We go throughout our work week. With the biggest case of the mopies. Or the Mondays that you ever did see. How many know what I'm talking about? Monday's coming. Oh, I'm a child of the king. Well, I mean, they're singing my song. I'll rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord. Lord. When God gives us access to the throne room of heaven, if we realized what the spirit inside of us was allowing us to feel and experience, uh, the Bible calls it the earnest of our inheritance. It's a taste of what heaven is going to be like. uh, But we allow carnality. uh, We allow the mindsets of this world. uh, We allow the thought processes of this region uh, to get in our minds. uh, We allow anxiety and fear fear to shut off the well. Uh, We allow human thinking uh, and critical thinking uh, and reasoning of this world uh, and science falsely so called uh, to put up a barrier inside of us uh, and tell us even when uh, the worship team's hitting all the right notes uh, and we're singing about rejoicing in heaven, even then we find ourselves in a place where we can't rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. I love that song. Oh, I can't wait for the day when we rise up. Can you throw that up there? Throw that up there. The bridge. I think it's the bridge. But I want to change the lyrics. Look, there's a day coming in heaven when he calls his church home. And these wells of salvation that we've been drinking from uh, will take us from this world to another. And I'm going to cross through a gate of pearl. uh, And I'm going to go down a street of gold. uh, I'm going to fall before his feet on a throne. uh, I'm going to cast my crown at his feet. uh, And I can't wait uh, for that day to come. But Paul did not write, rejoice in the Lord once you get to heaven. And again, I say rejoice then. He wrote, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Uh, And so I want to change the lyrics of that song uh, and begin to sing, oh, uh, I won't wait for that day uh, when we rise up. Uh, Every tear, yeah, it's going to be wiped from my eye, uh, but I ain't waiting for that day. Uh, I'm going to do it right now. Is there more than one or two? Is there more than one or two that's going to let this sink down inside of your heart? I won't wait. I'll rejoice now. I'll rejoice now. I'll rejoice now. Come on. Whether you feel like it, whether you don't, whether you want to or whether you don't, whether you're nervous. Rejoice in the Lord always. Uh, And again, I say uh, rejoice. Uh, Rejoice in the Lord uh, always. Uh, And again, uh, I say rejoice. With joy. With joy will they draw water from the wells of salvation. And if that is not your Christian experience, uh, I've come today to tell you exactly how it can become uh, your Christian experience. Uh, You're here today, uh, and it's time to dig. Uh, Dig out the carnality. Uh, Dig out the fleshly thinking. Uh, Dig out the attitudes of the flesh uh, and begin to obey. 
See, it's not a matter of whether or not I feel like it. It's simply a matter of obedience. He's a good God. He's a good God. He's a faithful God. He's a holy God. He's a righteous God. And so Isaac digs again the wells of his father, Abraham. And he calls them by the same name that they called them. I'm thankful for forefathers that have gone before. I'm thankful for a pastor that came to Watertown and fought some battles and struggled through some things but triumphed over them. I'm thankful uh, that somebody took the time uh, to dig a well uh, that would tap into a life-giving flow of the Spirit. Uh, I'm thankful that we don't have to come uh, to the house of God and try to gin up or stir up something out of emotion. Uh, But there was somebody uh, that went before that dug a well. We don't need to change the name uh, of those wells. Uh, We don't need to change the name of a well uh, of consecrated living. Uh, We don't need to change the well uh, of prayer. Uh, We don't need to change the well uh, of holiness, uh, both inside and outside. Uh, Those wells, those wells still work. The Bible said that Isaac was not complete and he was not done. He sent his servants to dig uh, in the valley and found there a well of springing water. I've come just to tell somebody today, if you'll start digging, you're going to find that springing water you've been looking for. You're going to find access to that flow uh, of the Holy Ghost you've been after. Uh, Do not get jealous. Uh, Do not get resentful of somebody else uh, that's tapping into the flow of the Holy Ghost. You know why they're tapping into the flow of the Holy Ghost? Uh, Because while we were over here in a tent uh, getting angry and upset, uh, there were some servants in a valley uh, that were digging uh, and getting the dirt out of the well uh, and getting down to something. uh, And out of that comes flowing a spring of living water. But the Bible says that the herdsmen of Gerar begin to contend with Isaac's herdsmen saying, this is, this is our water. This is supposed to be ours. And so they called the name of the well Isaac, which means argument because they strove with him. And so sometimes when you begin to dig down inside of yourself, Because I want that spirit to be flowing in me with an unstoppable force. A a river of living water that's birthed out of me. And my experience isn't matching up with that. But I'm not going to sit back and be lazy. I'm going to dig. But argument will come. When you begin to push deeper in the presence of God, argument will come. Who do you think you are? I know what you were doing last week. I I know what family you come from. Ooh, I feel the Holy Ghost there. I know what your childhood was like. I know that secret you don't want anybody else to know. Argument will come. But look at what Isaac does. He digs again. He says, fine. You you might have that. Fine, whatever. I'm just going to dig again. And so the Bible records that Isaac and his servants, they they go to another place because there's a hunger and there's a thirst for that living water. There's a thirst for something greater uh, than just a shallow, tepid pool every once in a while. Can I tell somebody uh, there is more of God uh, than just a lame prayer meeting every week, uh, once a week or for 30 minutes. Uh, There's more to God uh, than a single tear on a Sunday. There's more to God than a thrill down your leg. Uh, You have access uh, to springs of living water. And so he digs again. And the enemy shows up again. My goodness. And they now name this well Sitna, which means adversary. Look, I don't believe Christians should make enemies. But you will have enemies. You will have adversaries. When you go in pursuit of all that God has promised. You, you will bump into some people that are not, not all that keen on you getting deeper in the Lord. Not all that keen on your sudden growth and interest in spirituality. You know why? It convicts their carnality. 
which is quenching the flow. It's that earth that they put into those wells of Abraham. But Isaac digs again. And the adversary shows up. And so Isaac says, you know what, fine. I'll go over here. I'll dig over here. And so he digs a third well. And now the Bible says that the enemy did not strive with him. And so they named the well Rehoboth, which means room. Hear me, somebody, right now. You might have been digging and you got discouraged because there was an argument. You got discouraged because the adversary showed up. Uh, but if you'll just grab that shovel one more time today uh, and you'll begin to strike it into the earth uh, and you'll begin to dig out the flesh uh, and you'll begin to push like never before, God will make a way. Uh, God will allow a spring uh, to begin to rise up in your life in a place called room. He'll make room for you. The Bible says that he goes up from thence to a place called Beersheba. And the Lord appears to him, verse 24, in the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. You see, none of this would have happened if Isaac had just stopped digging and been content to dwell in the land of promise but always fighting for access to the Spirit. It's that poverty mindset that Sister Jordan nailed down this, this morning. If, if he would have been content, well, I guess I guess I can't grow my flocks any bigger because I don't have no water. I guess I guess... Maybe God wasn't going to bless me with the land because I, I, I ain't got no access to the water. How many of you come into the house of God on a Sunday sometimes and you just can't feel the Spirit? Anybody? I got two honest folks in the house. There are days where it feels like you're just walking through mud. You're walking through earth. You're fighting your way forward. What about prayer time in your own home? Anybody have prayer time in your own home? That was the first question. <laughs> I'm scared now. But you have prayer times in your home and it feels like you're, you're fighting through something. You're just walking through mud. You got an answer. It's dig. Dig. Because the Bible tells us with joy we'll draw water out of the wells of salvation. Uh, with joy uh, we've got access to the Spirit of God. Uh, that Holy Ghost inside of us will be like a river of living water uh, springing up inside of my soul. Uh, how do I get through uh, the dirt uh, and the muck uh, and the mire and the flesh uh, and the spiritual atmosphere of this region? I simply make up in my mind that he is God, he is good, and there's nothing that can stand against him, and I just begin to rejoice in the Lord. Come on, somebody. It's time to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice, 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 rejoice. rejoice. These are not two separate things. I'm trying to help somebody today. I'm trying to get what I feel in here out through here, and maybe it's not totally happening, but I'm trying to help somebody today. These are not two separate things. Uh, what I mean by dig, uh, yes, you got to get the carnality out. Uh, yes, you got to get the worldliness out of your life so that there's no impediment to the flow, uh, but there's every so often you're just going to have to work that pump handle, uh, and once you begin to rejoice in the Lord, uh, you can draw out of the well of salvation with great joy in your life. Let's try it this way. Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13. The writer says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, 
forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. James, why don't you help me real quick? That's the mark. This is the argument. This is the adversary. Yeah. There's a mark over there. And there's a prize. What is the prize? The prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. What's the high calling of God in Christ Jesus? That I get to be like him and I get to be with him for all of eternity. That's better than winning a Lamborghini. That's better than winning the biggest house in town. That's better than marrying the, the, the person you've ever dreamed about marrying. It's better than graduating from Harvard. It's the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And it's right over there. Now He could probably beat me in the flesh. But Paul said, I press toward the mark. Come on, this is... This is, yeah, go make me work for it. It's okay. It's all right. You're, you're giving in too easy. You're making it too easy. Let's try this again. This is your Monday prayer meeting. This is your Monday prayer meeting. I press toward the mark. I, I press. I press towards the mark. There's a prize over there. If you'll keep your eye on the prize, it'll make the press a little better. But whoa. If you'll keep your eye on what you're striving for, it'll make it a little bit better. If you'll keep your focus on what you're trying to get to, hey, I get to be like Jesus. I get to be with Jesus. Come on back up, adversary. We'll just stay here for a moment. I was going to use shovels, but I figured waving shovels around in here wildly might get... Out of hand. This way I'm the only one getting hurt. And then you come into church. And the worship team is singing about something. And you're just like. Pfft. And Sister Flores is like. All right everybody let's worship the Lord. Let's lift our hands. And you're not rebellious. So you're like okay. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You ever come into the house of God with that feeling? Yeah. And you're here and you're just like, man, there's a prize, but the adversary's too great. I mean, look at him. He's six foot two, eyes of blue. <laughs> He's got muscle. His biceps have biceps. And here I am. I'm just little old me. Oh, you can laugh, but we all do this. Yeah. And we get made up in our mind. No, no, today's just not my day. What a lie from hell. If you ever have a prayer meeting or you ever come to the house of God and you hear something in your head say, today's just not your day. Maybe next Sunday. You ought to nip that in the bud. You ought to drive that out. Why? Because uh, we've got a God that said we can triumph always. Uh, we've got a God uh, whom I can rejoice in uh, always. There's no Sunday that's not your Sunday. Uh, there's no prayer meeting uh, that's not your prayer meeting. Uh, if you will. If you will make up in your mind to rejoice, uh, if you'll settle it down inside of yourself, uh, he's a good God. Uh, and the press, uh, hear me somebody right now, if you get nothing else today, get this. Uh, the prize is worth the press. The prize uh, is worth the press. Come on, that prize uh, is worth the press. Uh, no matter how much digging I have to do, uh, no matter how much fighting I have to do, uh, no matter how hard uh, I got to push uh, and I got to fight uh, and I got to get him out of my way, uh, eventually I'm getting my prize. Uh, I'm getting... I'm getting to the other side. I'm reaching a place where that river of the Spirit begins to flow in my life. 